Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Tuesday morning Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, two speakers, one of which has come from Colorado and the other ones are local, uh, Dr. Chris Lynn Blade, and I think he's gonna start, so I'll do him first. He's a pediatric cardiologist and our medical director of our fetal cardiology program here at Phoenix Children's. He also serves as a program director uh, of the fourth year advanced uh, non-invasive cardiac imaging fellowship at Phoenix Children's. He's an assistant professor at Mayo Clinic, uh, Scottsdale, as well as University of Arizona College of Medicine and Creighton School of Medicine. He's skilled in advanced cardiac imaging techniques, including advanced fetal echocardiography and transesophageal echocardiography. He first joined Phoenix Children's to start up the fetal cardiology program, uh, and he's enjoyed the challenges of building the program, and it's become, uh, and is very proud of the success it's become. After graduating for, with his Bachelor's of Science in Biology from Wheaton College in Illinois, Dr. Lynn Blade earned his medical degree at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. He then did an internship and residency at the University of Texas McGovern Medical School in Houston, and then a pediatric cardiology fellow at, fellowship at Indiana University in, in Indianapolis. Now, Dr. Lynn Blade has been nominated as Phoenix Phys uh, Children's Physician of the Year twice and is a top doctor in pediatric uh, cardiovascular diseases by Phoenix Magazine for many consecutive years. He's committed to advancing the field of pediatric cardi cardiovascular research. His peer review uh, research has been published in the journal American Heart Association, Pediatric Radiology, Prenatal Diagnosis, and, our, uh, and Arthritis and Rheumatology, amongst many others. He's presented at national and international meetings and has numerous uh, uh, journal articles, abstracts, and chapters from medical textbooks. Uh, he will be joined by Dr. Brent uh, from the Colorado uh, Fetal Care Center. Uh, Dr. Brent's uh, a pediatric surgeon who specializes in uh, operating on fetuses. Uh, he did additional fetal surgery fellowship at the Colorado Fetal Care Center, specializing in laser procedure for twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Uh, fetal shunt procedures, open fetal uh, meningeal myelocele closures, ex utero intrapartum uh, treatment deliveries, and fetal transfusions. He conducts fetal research focused on innovating imaging techniques, uh, meningeal myelocele closures, care, and uh, TT and trend to trend transfusion syndrome. And uh, they've got the most impressive videos of any Grand Rounds presenter of the year, uh, as well as the largest uh, file size. So uh, without any uh, Further else, uh, Dr. Uh, Wimbley, Dr. Brent, take it over. Right. All right, thank you, John. Uh, that was very kind. So um, uh, again, welcome everyone this morning. Uh, it's been a lot of fun putting together this talk. Uh, what uh, Nick uh, is across uh, disciplines. I just mentioned I'm a pediatric cardiologist. He's an MFM specialist, a fetal surgeon uh, across institutions. So obviously we're here local in Phoenix and Colorado joining us across state lines. Also, it's been uh, a lot of uh, fun times dialoguing about this. So I hope you guys all enjoy uh, today's talk on high-risk fetal conditions and the cardiovascular evaluation and potential for prenatal, interpartum, and postnatal intervention. Uh, we have no financial disclosures, either one of us. The only thing I suppose I should disclose is that I am on faculty at U of A, and I did pick U of A to go all the way and uh, my, my bracket has not busted yet. So I'm really excited about that. So we'll see where this goes. Um, all right, so my job at the beginning of this talk is to really set the stage on discussion about fetal heart failure. And then we're gonna go in and talk about various different conditions that lead to fetal heart failure and their intervention. So, and with a very broad brush stroke, fetal heart failure is basically the, fetal, the failure of the fetal heart to properly fill or in diastole and eject in systole properly to pump enough blood to meet the needs of this developing fetus. Now, obviously the fetus is growing, developing and uh, changing within that placental and maternal environment. And uh, that heart has special demands placed on it. And we can think of fetal heart failure in terms of the very same concepts that we talk about postnatal heart failure, when we talk about the concepts of preload or the volume of blood coming back to the heart, afterload, the uh, pressure that it has to pump against, and then myocardial contractility. All of these have profound interactions, both with diastolic function and systolic dysfunction, primarily being related to the myocardial contractility and the afterload, all impacting stroke volume or the volume of blood that leaves the heart in systole. 
you multiply that times heart rate, and then you get the very fundamental um, calculation, stroke volume times heart rate, which equals cardiac output. There are two general categories of fetal heart failure, low cardiac output state, and then high cardiac output state, which is related, for example, to volume loading um, or anemia in the fetus. And while there are several different causes of fetal heart failure, such as twin to twin transfusion syndrome, infection, chromosomal uh, abnormalities, when you look at cardiac causes of fetal hydrops or heart failure, they kind of break down into these categories. About 40% are related to actual structural heart disease, a third related to arrhythmias, about 13% related to high output failure, then cardiomyopathies and cardiac tumors. And it's also important to recognize that the fetus, as well as the postnatal baby, has compensatory mechanisms to compensate for um, heart failure. Uh, and that's called the brain sparing uh, effect, which is one of the ways that we shunt blood to the vital organ, our, our organs, our brain, um, by lowering the cerebral vascular resistance. We can assess that prenatally by Dopplering the middle cerebral artery that shows that there's increased flow going out to the brain uh, when we have decreased um, cardiac output. Also, the kidneys are activated through the renin angi angiotensin system in order to maintain adequate um, blood delivery uh, to uh, the vital organs. There are fundamental differences between fetal and postnatal circulation. Now, when postnatal circulation occurs, the ductal artery closes all the way. And again, at its very fundamental understanding, all that deoxygenated blood returns from the body to the right heart, is pumped by the right ventricle out to the pulmonary arteries, returns with highly oxygenated blood to the left atrium, left ventricle to be pumped out to the aorta. This is what we call series circulation, where our output of the right ventricle and the left ventricle are equal. However, the pressure in the right ventricle is lower than the pressure on the, in the left ventricular side. And what's important to recognize when you have series circulation, failure of one ventricle is sufficient enough to cause complete circulatory collapse, actually, um, if it's severe enough within the entire organism. Now, on contrary to that, in fetal circulation, we have three significant shunts, the ductus arteriosus, the foramenal valley, and the ductus venosus. This sets up parallel circulation where we have actually two times the amount of blood flow going through the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. And the pressures are equal in both the right and left ventricular size. and uh, and what's important about that is that the fetus, the ventricles actually act independently. So the preload, afterload, contractility of the right ventricle independently re, uh, acts on the loading conditions. On the left ventricle, there is ventricular-ventricular interaction that we see within the fetus. But in the fetus, we can typically compensate by the other ventricle that has not reached failure yet for the dysfunction that happens in the other ventricle. Also important to recognize is that the myocardial elements of the fetus are immature. There's less contractile elements. The actin myosin binding is not yet matured in the fetus. And uh, the, um, the use of calcium in the contractility, as well as the use of only glucose as the energy substrate in the fetus really puts this fetus at a unique disadvantage for fetal heart failure. So my job as a fetal cardiologist is to evaluate the failing heart um, uh, with echo. That's my primary tool that I use. Um, we can't use a stethoscope. I can't use physical exam findings. I have to rely on echo. And so um, these are just several of the findings that we use on echo, um, kind of broke them down into what we see earlier versus later or more end stage um, stages of heart failure. So early on, we'll see enlargement of the heart or hypertrophy as well. There can be uh, abnormal cardiac filling, valve regurgitation of the AV valves. You may start to see some mild decrease in the systolic contractility, um, as well as some Doppler derangements. I did highlight the um, altered cardiac output because you may have decreased cardiac output or you actually may have increased cardiac output, especially with some of the lesions that we're gonna be talking today as an early stage of heart failure. Then when you go into the later stages of heart failure, you'll definitely see that decreased contractility and you'll get to see that today. Um, more advanced um, Doppler changes as well as development of things like ascites, 
or fusions, edema of the skin, basically fetal hydrops, and changes in the um, uh, uh, the amniotic fluid as well. And then eventually that leads to decreased fetal movement um, and fetal death. So these are the Doppler changes that we see in early and late um, uh, heart failure when we're assessing by echo. So we have the atrioventricular valves, which has um, uh, still a split E and A wave, and then it's fused in the severe um, heart failure patient where you don't see that separation between early diastolic and active uh, diastolic filling. Um, our IVC Doppler is also um, progressively more abnormal when we lose that diastolic component in our um, IVC Doppler. Our ductus venosus um, Doppler pattern is seen there. You start to see the A wave reversal here um, in um, more severe forms of uh, heart failure. And then finally, our umbilical vein moves from a um, more continuous to a pulsatile uh, Doppler pattern in the umbilical vein. As fetal cardiologists, we talk to one another, try to quantify the severity of fetal heart failure by using this term cardiovascular profile score. It's a 10 point scoring system um, where lower number is worse heart failure. And um, many of the things that are listed on the left column, we've already talked about, so I'm not going to review them, but just know that this has been around for decades, um, initially um, published by Jim Huda. Um, and modified throughout the, um, the years to basically uh, help us understand what the likelihood uh, and, out and predict outcomes for this fetus. Now, you can't just use this within isolation. You also have to think about what are the causes of the failing fetal heart. Um, for example, if the fetus is anemic, well, you give a blood transfusion and typically that's reversible and you can get the kid to a, a gestational age where we can get the child out um, versus say a patient has severe Epstein's anomaly um, and, uh, and has a low cardiovascular profile score. That's going to be correlated with um, high fetal mortality. So we're going to move on to a case. Um, this is a 25-year-old um, lady, um, G2P0, uh, uh, our first pregnancy was uh, termination, was referred to us uh, for concern for hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and also there was a family history of cardiomyopathy. Um, mom's side of the family, really nothing exciting, but dad's side, quite interesting. Um, he had a history of left ventricular non-compaction that was diagnosed at three months old and actually had a heart transplant at 15 months old. Uh, his, and he had a prior child with another woman um, that resulted in a bad heart. There wasn't a lot of details and there was immediate neonatal de demise after delivery with this baby. So um, Dr. Wynn saw this patient, so I got to credit him for this slide. Um, he did a great job kind of putting together a timeline here. Um, and so they presented to the OB at 21 weeks um, and got a referral to us where we saw them at 23 weeks where already we had dysfunction that was in the mild range and our heart size was borderline enlarged at that time, the cardiothoracic area ratio, the area of the heart over the area of the thorax is how we um, uh, abbreviate that CTAR. Um, as we went on, we saw that four weeks later, uh, the function of the right ventricle and left ventricle had um, deteriorated. We developed um, tricuspid regurgitation. Our heart became more enlarged. Our ductus venosus Doppler patterns were abnormal at that point. We saw progressive disease where we had no forward flow across the pulmonary valve at that point in time, and we had reversal of flow in the ductal artery. So normally our ductus arteriosus goes from the pulmonary artery into the aorta, as I showed earlier. In this case, the blood flow was going from the aorta into the pulmonary artery. So we weren't injecting well from our right ventricle. And we developed a fusion, which progressed over time and our heart became very enlarged. Here at Phoenix Children's with our Center for Fetal Neonatal Care, we use the multi-D conference. Um, we call them MDCs for short, where we pull in our subspecialists that are pertinent to this case. And, and we then pull in the family as well. And we do this via Zoom. We really brought these on kind of during the COVID era. And it's been a great tool to um, uh, bring our families and specialists up to speed. We did that. And then we brought this to our heart center here at Phoenix Children's prenatally. And we developed a plan for all the stakeholders to have the buy-in for this patient. And we developed the plan, as you see there, and we would even consider ECMO candidacy depending on the age, the weight of the baby, when the baby had delivered. 
child made it all the way to 39 weeks actually and got suctioned at um, um, secondary to bradycardia followed the plans that we'd actually laid out and actually responded well to our our uh, treatment. Um, so um, just to show you what this looked like uh, for us prenatally, this is interesting. So you see at 23 weeks, our right ventricle is already not squeezing as well as our left ventricle. And then look just four weeks later, that RV now is globular. We call it a sophisticated sphericity index, which is more round in shape. It's losing its normal um, geometry and it's definitely not functioning as well. And now with advanced uh, imaging, we can see these changes in cardiac function with echo, not just anatomically, but we do this with Doppler. We can do this with strain. We can do this with tissue Doppler. That's a whole nother talk. Um, then at 32 weeks, you can now see that both ventricles are dramatically enlarged um, and dysfunctional. You can see that tricuspid valve regurgitation as well there. And, um, and so, uh, and then our Doppler patterns are uh, clearly abnormal uh, at this point where we have um, that monophasic inflow pattern. So this is what I was referring to with that lack of forward flow in the ductus arteriosus. Um, we have the ductus arteriosus flow here, and then this is our aorta um, going both forward um, uh, as it should be in the fetus. Over here, our forward flow, our red color going towards the transducer is going through the aorta back to our descending aorta here but our flow in our ductus arteriosus is going reverse from the aorta into the pulmonary artery. So this was clearly indication that we were going to have to start prostaglandins postnatally. We saw that progressive um, abnormalities in the ductus venosus Doppler patterns as well. Postnatally, child came out at three kilos. We did the interventions. We started prostaglandins, which has actually subsequently been weaned off. Um, Genetic testing showed that there was a defect in the tropomycin gene, um, which was in inherited through the father as an autosomal dominant pattern. And child's had a heart transplant. It's actually in our cardiac ICU today. Um, doing very well on room air, on 0.25 of milbronone, weaning, transitioning to oral heart failure medications, hoping that we're going to transition home and um, and then continue to be followed with our, I think they call it the heart rehabilitation team. They don't like heart failure team. Um, and it has negative connotations. Um, but uh, so we hope to have a good outcome for this child. So this is just a summary slide of the teaching points from this case about a low cardiac, cardiac output patient that um, we... Um, we're able to have surveillance prenatally and do good counseling prenatally to set us up for some tough decisions for the family and healthcare team members um, after birth. So I'm gonna uh, just quickly just take us for the rest of the talk. Um, we're gonna use this uh, drawing from the 1500s where Leonardo da Vinci, amazing individual, brilliant, um, that uh, wasn't just an amazing artist, but also drew, um, anatomic uh, uh, drawings that um, really reflected the fetus within the maternal environment in the placenta. So we've uh, we've already talked about dilated cardiomyopathy. We're gonna be moving on eventually to talking about vena galen, sacrococcygeal teratoma, and then the chorioangioma. So on that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Barrent and he'll take us from here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, you know, Dr. Limblay got to do, I think, the heavy lifting part of the talk where he put a lot of academic things in there and showed you a lot of stuff. I get to do the show and tell part of the talk. So mine's just kind of fun to, to show you guys. Um, all of these topics we're covering here could probably be their own grand rounds or even a, you know, full day symposium on how to handle things. So the point of it isn't to uh, go through all the finer details of how to take care of sacred oxygen teratoma. The idea of it is, is how can we use some of these tools that we have? How can we use this multi-D conference uh, in Denver for us? Um, I was talking to Melanie before. I don't know if is Mike in here, um, but not too many years ago, uh, you would literally just walk across the hallway and say, help. Uh, it, either way, hopefully, probably more my mind to cardiology's way. So we're going to talk about a troublemaker called sacred cox steel teratoma um, and how this how the heart can help us know how to handle and best take care of that. Um, 
So this is a patient that came to us in Denver. She was about 25 weeks. She got uh, referred to us um, because she had uh, a large uh, fetal sacral mass. Now, when you see that come through the the uh, consult uh, service, um, you know you have a pretty big differential. But pretty quickly, we started to see uh, this large, kind of solid cystic-looking structure here, uh, and you can even kind of can uh, tell compared to the fetal abdomen, it's pretty huge. Uh, and, it, and it looks like a, a pretty big troublemaker. So um, this is uh, this is kind of taking a look again. This is using color Doppler to take a look at this mass. You can see pretty obviously here uh, that there's this huge uh, sacral mass. You see the cystic components, but the most striking thing, the most worrisome thing when we see a structure like this is you can just see the Doppler pattern. You can see these vessels that are just sort of coursing through this uh, tumor, um, and that for us piques our attention and says, okay, this this can be trouble. Um, one of the things I love about uh, fetal medicine, Dr. Limblade alluded to, you don't get to use your stethoscope or really your physical exam skills, but we do have a lot of pretty cool tools that we can put together to try to come up with, uh, with ways to help. Um, this technology on the right here, this is called Vocal Virtual Organ Computer Aided Analysis. It's basically a way uh, to make a 3D reconstruction of any sort of ultrasound structure. You can use this outside of fetal medicine. In this case, we used vocal to get an estimate of how large this mass was. And at this time, it was 420 cube centimeters, uh, which roughly uh, is the same in grams. And so uh, you can see by the highlight section, about a half, about a half estimate weight compared to the fetus. This MRI, I think, speaks for itself. You can see uh, on fetal MRI, you can see this, the fetus there. And then again, this just honestly pretty gigantic mass coming off uh, the sacrum, which is a sacrococcygeal teratoma, um, which uh, just looking again at this picture alone, uh, we know we're going to potentially have uh, some issues. I'm not going to go through the details of this slide. There are classification systems for uh, sacrococcygeal teratoma. Really what matters to us when we see this in utero is um, how big is it? That matters a lot. Probably more importantly, what kind of vascularity do you see? Um, as Dr. Limblay talked about, we can look inside the heart to see some of our predictors of how things are gonna go in utero and in some ways ex utero. Um, in this case, that vascularity makes you worried because now you have this large immature mass um, that is a sink of blood vessels. So we think about our autoregulatory mechanisms that we have in our blood vessels in our body. This SCT doesn't have those autoregulatory functions. And so you really have this just large sink of blood, uh, of blood vessels that are going to steal from the heart. They're going to cause the heart potentially to work harder. And so we know to be nervous about that. Risk factors. Um, you guys can look at this slide, but really, again, comes down to solid and vascular is bad. Cystic and non-vascular, it's not that it's good, but it's better. The predictors are better. We don't have to get quite as creative, I think, as far as in utero and ex utero care. You can see some blood vessel measurements there. Fetal tumor ratio greater than 0.12. That's based on some old studies. In this case, we were already at 0.5, so pretty huge. Um, and then all of those things that Dr. Limblade showed before, all of those predictors that he showed for cardiomyopathy are just as relevant to something like this. So you don't have native heart disease, but you do have a tumor that can cause the same effects. For this patient on first evaluation, again, this large mass, the cardiothoracic ratio was already increasing. The fetal tumor ratio was high. The combined cardiac output was elevated. And then one of the other features that we have is the MCA Doppler. So the uh, speed of blood through, flow through the MCA Dopplers were elevated, probably partially due to work of the heart and also probably part of the fetus, at least to some level, having some level of anemia. And then the AFI, the amniotic fluid index, was kind of just above normal. We see that pretty commonly when we uh, see uh, tumors and things causing heart failure. So this is looking a few weeks later. The mass is larger. Vocal technology now shows that it's at 630 centimeters cubed. You can see that this woman's AFI is starting to increase. We're now at an AFI over 40. Um, and then we can tell again, things are starting to go downhill. We're starting to get worried. Uh, not all of these tumors uh, act the same way, but 
I feel pretty confident guessing that if you have a large vascular cystic uh, and solid mass around the beginning of the third trimester, things are going to start to go downhill. Uh, and so we've used that expertise to know we got to start watching closer. And we're trying to we're trying to uh, basically like stay on the line of how long can we wait before delivery, uh, balancing prematurity uh, and compromise. These are a, a couple pictures here of the heart. You can see on the left side, the CT ratio is increasing. You can just tell with your eyes that the heart appears big. You can see the heart function on the right side. Again, big heart in this chest, heart working harder. Um, and again, for my eyeballs, I don't interpret any of that. I go to my fetal cardiologist to tell me what I'm seeing. So um, here's another image here. You can see on the left side that heart's just not working quite as well. You can see on the right side, that we're starting to see some valvular dysfunction. And again, the heart rocking a little bit more than it should. Um, and then again, it's just huge. It looks really big in that chest. So that heart is working hard. It's trying to pump blood to the tumor, to the fetus. Um, and it, and it's uh, we're starting to see sort of that downhill swing. Third evaluation, getting worse, getting worse. We're now again, early third trimester. We're to the point where unfortunately we don't have an in utero intervention uh, to make this mass not cause problems but we have the potential to help uh, for delivery. To kind of get at what Dr. Lindblad had talked about before, we talk about the physiology of things. So prenatally, you have your blood vessels coming in from the placenta, going through the umbilical cord, feeding uh, the fetal heart, the fetus then using its heart to pump blood sort of throughout the body. And then because of this tumor, you have that steel, you have this big red arrow here going to this tumor that says, that, that fetus is not only pumping blood to itself, but also to this large mass and causing problems. So prenatally, it's a problem, right? You can get into heart failure, high drops, and eventually death. So one of the questions is, do you just deliver and do you, do you just take care of the baby afterwards? Well, probably an even bigger problem that happens postnatally is that now you've come through, you have in the fetal circulation, you have a placenta that's relatively low resistance, right? Like the physiology is, it wants to be low resistant. It wants to push blood to the placenta. The fetus wants to get blood to the placenta. That's sort of how that physiology works. But this tumor is also low resistant. So at least in utero, there's probably some level of competition between the two going on, the two low resistant circuits. If you just deliver this fetus, you disrupt the blood flow to and from the placenta, which is the black box here. Now you've taken away the low resistant placenta. The only low resistance you have left is this large mass and so the three large red arrow sign says there's going to be a lot of blood potentially that goes to this mass. And so you actually get, you can actually get to a situation where you essentially have a fetus that can bleed into this tumor uh, and, and honestly get really sick and pass away if you don't think about that. So it's not as simple as deliver, clamp the cord. Now we're in, we're in the clear. It's how can we make these, make this big shunt uh, less, less, uh, less happening. Exit technique, um, again, a whole nother lecture in it itself, but uh, it's a technique that was developed to try to take advantage of fetal physiology around the time of delivery in order to uh, optimize that transition from fetal to neonatal life. If you look up when exits were developed, the first things, the first uh, use of them were for fetal neck masses. So when you have a problem with airways at delivery, and so you would partially deliver the fetus, you would keep the fetus connected to maternal, uh, the maternal circulation. You have like all of your markers show like fetal physiology. You can intubate, you can debulk, you can do anything and then take advantage of that. So it's like super ICU care from the maternal circulation without having to do all that ICU care while dealing with uh, this tumor in this situation. So this video is going to be uh, exit of an SCT in about two minutes. So it's very abbreviated and sped up a little bit. But the idea is we need to get access to the fetal tissue. Uh, we need to get take away the SCT or at least debulk it before delivery um, in order to uh, make that transition to postnatal life. And so try to debulk the tumor, take away that sink. This is a large uterus. This is at like 28 weeks. And that, that uterus is gigantic. We're using a stapling device here in order to open up the uterus. You can see the fetal leg coming out here. You can start an IV in that leg. You can start to give blood products. The mom is under general anesthesia. 
Um, and again, if you were to like do a pulse ox on that leg or on the hand or look at the physiology, it would look like fetal circulation. This is the tumor coming out right now. It is striking. It is, it is huge. You can see us sort of shoehorning it out in some ways. Now that that tumor is out, everything is pretty stable. This is a cardiologist right here monitoring the fetal heart. So we don't have those physical exam signs, but we can watch the heart as we go. We're giving blood products as needed. You can see the pediatric surgery team then essentially going through and removing this tumor. You can see them using a, um, a ligature there. They're going through. They're debulking the tumor. The idea is not to necessarily do uh, the greatest tumor removal ever. It's to get rid of as much as you can. You can see in this picture, the placenta is down here. You can see the cord, which looks like pretty normal cord blood flow. This is almost an hour of exit procedure. Still looks pretty good. You can now see at this point, that tumor has been removed. You can see the fetal perineum. Uh, the fetus is now out. They're now doing uh, intubating and you have a much more stable situation. You've taken advantage of that maternal circulation. So now we've gone from prenatal to neonatal, and we've gotten rid of a big troublemaker that can happen if you just deliver that fetus and then try to debulk that tumor while also doing resuscitations and, and things of that nature. This is the specimen uh, after removal. That's pretty gigantic. I don't know if everybody here has seen a uh, really fancy name placenta bucket. I don't know if that's a real term. Uh, that's what we call it at least. So uh, the placenta bucket had the tumor in it there. Um, this is like a couple of days post-op. And so I, I show the pictures here um, where you can see again, sort of like an abnormal appearance uh, on the on the bottom of the fetus. There are some drains in place. Um, but at the time of discharge, which was like three months later, looks pretty good, looks pretty normal. Uh, and has pretty good and had pretty good function overall. But the big thing again is we had a tool uh, through uh, cardiology, through MRI, through ultrasound to find something uh, to make a game plan and then to to end up in a, in a good situation. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Lindblade for this section. Amazing. That was. An awesome video. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we're going to move on to this lesion now. We've talked about below the heart. Now we're going to go above the heart, we're talking about the vein of Galen malformation. So very similarly to the highly vascular, low resistance structure of the SCT, vein of Galen malformation is a, also a highly vascular structure that causes um, arterial venous malformation in the brain where you have direct connection from the choroidal arteries of the cerebral arteries directly into the cerebral veins. Um, and it's a relatively rare type of uh, intracranial anomaly, but when it presents, it's going to present either prenatally or as a neonate. So there are two different subtypes of this. Choroidal, which is the more severe form, has an earlier presentation. Like I said, either as a fetus or a neonate, it's more challenging to treat because those blood vessels go through the parenchyma of the brain and is also at higher risk for heart failure. Uh, for the pediatricians here, um, presenting signs of patients with uh, vein of Galen malformation, you have a rapidly enlarging head circumference, hydrocephalus, irritability, potentially that's not explained, or vomiting, seizures. Don't forget when you're in the newborn nursery to auscultate the anterior fontanelle because you may pick up a brewy um, there. Um, so that's why we do that. Um, and uh, uh, where you can hear that AVM. Uh, a downward gaze or the sunsetter sign. And that's a favorite board question, I think, on the peat sports and developmental delay. Um, but it also may be detected prenatally. So, and that's usually by this abnormal um, blood flow that we see in the brain, um, which we do this as part of all of our fetal echoes, as well as the maternal fetal medicine ultrasound as well. Um, fortunately, the fetus, because of the circulation, having that low resistance placenta is at less of a risk for developing heart failure um, because the, it kind of balances out the low resistance in the vein of Galen. But when it happens, when heart failure is present, there's an 80% mortality in the fetus. Um, there's also continuing ongoing mortality risk in the neonate uh, at around 20 to 50%, really urging us um, and um, uh, 
prompting us to say, we need to come up with ways to intervene on these patients. So here's the physiology of why does this happen? So here's a normal circulation with venous return coming through the SVC and then going through the left side of the heart, going up to the cerebral vasculature. And then I know this is a little complex of a drawing, but what we're really seeing, if you just watch this arrow coming in, you have that reversal of flow in the transverse aorta because you have the steel of blood flow going through that low resistance a vein of galen malformation up in the brain, causing dilation of the SVC, the right ventricle becomes hypertensive and dilated and dysfunctional. And this is where we see the fetal heart failure related to the vein of galen malformation. Fortunately, we're uh, very blessed to have Dr. Luis Gonsalves uh, and his team with radiology here at Phoenix Children's doing fantastic fetal MRI. This is a fetal MRI image. I mean, such great detail here um, of showing us that there's this vein of Galen malformation um, here. And it helps us just illustrate these patients are also at risk for having um, pulmonary hypertension because there's increased flow going through there, therefore increased venous return going down into the right ventricle and flow and pressure going out into the pulmonary arteries. And as you would expect, when you have abnormal blood flow in the brain, these kids are at risk for um, brain injury. And we've seen a correlation with the severity of the heart failure and the level of brain injury with vein of Galen malformation uh, with encephalomalacia with this disease, almost universally being associated with severe heart failure. So this is a kid that we took care of um, here, and this is her last echo that we had during the pregnancy where you can see this very abnormal blood uh, vessel flow in the brain with some right atrial and right ventricular enlargement and dysfunction. Uh, like I said, this is a little bit older of a, a study, but you can see that th this is the aortic arch coming up and around um, here. I oriented this clip to help orient you to this slide. And this directionality of the um, blood flow, this red flow here is reversal of flow in the aorta being stolen again up to the brain through the vein of Galen malformation. We throw spectral Doppler over that too, and we can see that flow reversal in the aorta in the fetus with this uh, patient um, with vein of Galen malformation. So similarly, as uh, Dr. Barron talked about, when we deliver, at, uh, we have some key physiologic changes that can impact the um, patient with a vein of Galen malformation. First of all, our pulmonary vascular resistance starts to fall in our lungs, and that creates a higher flow going out to the lungs and an increased steel going through that vein of Galen malformation through the right ventricle. Also, we lose the ductus arteriosus postnatally, so we have increased afterload on that right ventricle. Our right ventricular dysfunction can worsen over time, and so that's a, a negative side uh, aspect of this change that happens at birth, and then obviously the placenta is gone. And so we increase our afterload as well because we've, de we've taken away the low resistance structure of the placenta. Dr. Todd Abruzzo and his team here at PCH um, do a fantastic job doing intervention on these children postnatally. And this is an example of a patient he shared with me of a three-month-old that had a vein of Galen that was detected prenatally. And what he did um, is he went after this um, uh, aneurysmal uh, structure here up through the cerebral arteries um, into vascularly and delivered coils into this um, structure here to reduce the size of the malformation over time. So here we are with the angiography pre-embolization and then times two stages of embolization. You can see that this structure now is barely opacifying. So we've really taken away that um, volume load that comes through the um, cerebral vasculature in the aneurysmal malformation. Three months later, you don't even see it. Amazing results here that uh, this patient now at three years of age has completely normal MRI, MRA with essential um, complete cure of this vein of Galen malformation. And this patient's neurologically normal, um, attending preschool and has actually having normal development. So again, um, being able to intervene postnatally is super exciting, but what about prenatal intervention? Well, 
get to share with you this very interesting case. This is the first case in the world that was done at the end of 2022, just published this year in France, of a baby that had vein of Galen malformation associated with heart failure. They did this all through ultrasound guidance, going into the uterus across the fontanelle of the fetus, um, going into the malformation, delivering 10 platinum coils um, to, as you can see over here on the right side of the screen, into this vein of ganglion malformation to embolize this. Um, the baby became unstable with um, hemodynamic um, instability. They stopped at that point. They were able to get six more weeks of gestation out of this growth. They did this around 32 weeks gestation. And uh, at the time of the publication, um, the patient was doing amazingly well at 11, almost a year of age without heart failure, normal neurodevelopmental milestones, did require two more stages of postnatal in intervention. But what's exciting about this is that it's opening up the world of prenatal intervention for this disease. Uh, and again, the staged approach for vein of galen malformation, again, is just another example of these high-risk fetal conditions that we can now intervene on prenatally, as well as in that postnatal uh, world um, to improve outcomes. So I'm going to switch back over one more time uh, to one last lesion that we're going to share with you all. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, placental choriangioma now. This is a good parallel uh, to what we talked about before with the sacrococcygeal teratoma. So uh, in both cases, you've got uh, an abnormal tumor that is affecting a fetus inside the uterus. Um, uh, they have similar effects on that fetus, uh, but as we'll talk about, uh, has have very different implications when it comes to sort of prenatal treatment and then postnatal uh, care. Um, you can see here a couple of uh, cine clips um, looking at the placenta. The placenta is this sort of grayish structure here. You see this sort of different echogenic mass. You can see uh, through this clip here, this large umbilical vein that comes over the top of it. And then this right here coming off the end is actually uh, the placental cord insertion of the umbilical cord. So you have this uh, placental cord insertion where the bulk of that, uh, those blood vessels are going in with a large tumor next to it. You put color flow Doppler on it. And again, it doesn't look exactly like the SCT that I showed before, but it looks pretty similar. It's a large solid mass. It's got some cystic components. And then the scary part of it, the troublemaker part of it is again, these immature abnormal blood vessels that are creating some level of a sink for this fetus. Um, and also, uh, at least in some ways, probably some level of overflow as well. So you see that. And again, if you see that, if you're doing prenatal evaluation, you got to start thinking, okay, are we in trouble and how do we monitor this? Choriangioma, relatively rare. Uh, if you look at placental specimens, there's a lot of pathology, a lot of pathology that'll say they can find these small tumors, but the larger ones are, are pretty unique. We don't see a lot of them. I think over, you know, over us doing this for well over a decade now, uh, we've really only seen about a handful of them that required any level of treatment. Significant risk. If you look at the first slide, one of the first slides that Dr. Limblade showed, if I talked about SCT, it's all the same risks. It's just a different physiology. It's, it's not a different physiology. It's a different tumor or problem causing the same physiology, fetal anemia, polyhydramnios, there's maternal risks as well, and ultimately trying to avoid fetal uh, compromise and death. This is, again, just kind of looking at this case here this multidisciplinary care, you've got MCA Doppler. So the peak systolic velocity is elevated. Lots of different reasons for that. In this case, we're worried that that tumor is stealing blood from that fetus and is therefore causing relative fetal anemia. And so we have fetal anemia and uh, some other levels of compromise. This over here is pretty striking too. I showed you that large umbilical vein sort of arcing over the top of the tumor. You can see here this umbilical vein, I mean, is 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 really gigantic. I mean, we're at about, I think about 25-ish weeks here. And it is just this huge sort of hose going uh, into the fetal abdomen, uh, showing again, you're, you're getting some level of vascular changes, uh, vessel changes, trying to compensate uh, and unfortunately not being able to do a really good job of that. These risk factors, almost the exact same slide as SCT. So again, establishing Tumors that have lots of vascularity are bad, no matter where they are inside, inside the uterus. Um, increased tumor size is bad. Placental cord insertion near the tumor is a, is a bad sign as well as I'd shown you. And then all those, again, all those exact same things Dr. Lindblade went through to say, 
these are bad signs and can be showing you problems of compromise. So for this case, for this patient uh, came in, we can do vocal volumes as we had done before uh, to look at the size of it. You can see across sort of different evaluations that volume's increasing, the MCA peak systolic velocity is increasing. So that either means that you have a heart that's getting overloaded, working harder and is having dysfunction and or you've got fetal anemia, the amniotic fluid index is increasing, again, probably showing that compensation to try to remove some of that sort of overflow. The CT ratio has increased a bit, and the combined cardiac is, output is increasing as well. So once we sort of got to that, what highlighted fourth thing here, volume higher, MCA is going up, AFI moving, CT ratio increasing, and then on, uh, on echo, more work of that heart and some valve dysfunction, the decision was to treat. So we talked about with SCT, no one has really given a compelling uh, report yet of being able to treat that in utero. It's been attempted. And again, that's another lecture in and of itself. But in this case, we have a tumor that's not directly connected to the fetus. So we have some, uh, we have potential intervention. People have tried different things in this scenario. We have sort of fallen into uh, using a sclerosing agent to essentially like do a deep debulking of the vascularity of it. So on the left side here, you can see us guiding uh, a 20 gauge needle through the maternal abdomen into the uterus lined up with the tumor. We then can advance that needle into that tumor, the choriangioma. And through that, we actually inject pure alcohol. It's 100% uh, alcohol. It's a, as we know in medicine, that's a bad agent for blood vessels. It's sclerosing, it causes problems. So in this case, we go in, we try to not inject directly into a blood vessel. It's probably not good to do that. And so we try to inject around the blood vessel to cause that tissue necrosis uh, in, and uh, changes. And you can see in this video here, you can see that sort of echogenic change that happens with that injection of the alcohol. That's what that, that's why it's flashing like that. This is uh, Looking at, again, same thing, we, we, you can't see the needle in this, but you can see this sort of echogenic area starting to kind of brighten and expand. And then when we look post-treatment, we can see some pretty big changes. Now, this is, an, is not immediately post-op. This is after several days. But you can just tell with color Doppler, that vascularity has changed significantly. We're not looking for perfection here. We're looking for improvement. We're trying to buy time. As Dr. Limblade said, with the cardiomyopathy, the vein of Galen we talked about with SCT, we want to take advantage of that in utero environment to gain as much maturity. But you can see how that vascularity has decreased. And over here on this side, you can see there's really not much vascularity at all. Uh, fortunately, those blood vessels on the outside, which are really important fetal vessels, uh, stayed patent. We didn't get alcohol uh, effects on those, but you can see that that mass is different. It's smaller now. And if you look at the fetus, you actually can see uh, that a lot of our markers have gotten better. The heart function improved. The mass got smaller, that umbilical vein actually got smaller. Again, you can see this echogenicity within this mass. The MCA Doppler has improved as well. And so we're, we're moving in the right direction. We're still watching close. I showed a similar slide to this before. And so we uh, this slide almost looks the same as I did for SCT on the prenatal side. So you've got the placental circulation. You've got this tumor. In these cases, we do believe that there's more, there is at least some exchange back to the fetus, some overload from the tumor as well, but essentially looks the same. We need to try to help things out in utero if we can. The big difference in the, in the, in the big help in this scenario is, is once you have delivered, right? Once you have stopped the blood flow through those umbilical vessels, you've now essentially gotten rid of your troublemaker, right? We talked about with SCT, you still have to go to delivery with this tumor still causing problems. In this case, the tumor is in the placenta. And so if we can bridge to a gestational age that is good enough for delivery, that is good enough for survival, and hopefully have helped the fetus out in those regards, once you've delivered this fetus, you're in a much better situation. You no longer have to worry about it. So you don't need an exit procedure. You don't need really any other big uh, changes after birth um, once you've sort of cut off that blood flow. Um, so in summary with that, again, a tumor acts like a tumor inside the womb, but they're very different uh, on, on how you can treat them and how you care for them, and honestly, how you follow them. So just to wrap it up, uh, these are this is a placeholder slide that just talks about all the other common causes of fetal heart failure. As listed here, we've talked about several of those today. 
Um, they're here just for your reference later on. And in summary, just uh, for Dr. Barron and I, just to summarize here again, we've talked about several high risk prenatal cardio uh, lesions that have cardiovascular consequences and they're very unique to the type of lesion that they are and they have different risk profiles both during pregnancy, intrapartum, and then postpartum, depending on where they're at in the maternal fetal placental circulation. Uh, we've talked about these unique uh, treatment options that we have, even starting uh, before birth through multidisciplinary care. And then this advancements in fetal imaging, fetal surgery, um, endovascular intervention are really providing opportunities to really change the course and morbidity and mortality for these high risk uh, lesions. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, uh, I know Dr. Barron could throw up a similar list of amazing team members at Colorado, but uh, again, this just really highlights, it takes a village of, of team members, and this is just the fetal cardiology aspect of our team here at PCH. And so um, I hope that uh, you guys uh, walk away with some good understanding from our talk today, and we're happy to entertain a few minutes of questions if we have some time. So we're happy to take any questions. Okay, Dr. Franklin. Chris. Yeah. Well, I'll start, I'll start with Dr. Barron, our guest. So okay. thank you very much. I was impressed with your video of how many hands were in that uh, video. Yeah. <laughs> sure there were more. And yeah, that was only the hands. You yeah. should see the rest of the room. <laughs> yeah, we've been about 40, 40, yeah, 40 people on the NICU yeah. side right next door just waiting for whatever they're going to get. Right, I, I remember that. Yeah. Um, and it seems like imaging is really key to what you get for timing and things like that. And, and how do you make a decision or take us through how you make that decision between doing an exit procedure, say like an intrauterine uh, case, like, like you showed there? Yeah, I think, um, so, you know, again, highlighting highlighting how you have to work as a team to do this. So, so exactly right. So this slide that Dr. Lindblad has up here, um, the, I think, it all starts with that that first evaluation, right? You're going to triage, you're going to screen and say, okay, how worried should we be about this lesion? I think a lot of it comes down to patient education as well. And so at our center, what we do is for a patient with that sacred coccygeal teratoma, that patient would come in, have a full day of evaluation, MRI, uh, echo, ultrasound, and then have a, a counseling session that includes PET surgery, neonatology, cardiology, maternal fetal medicine, usually genetics, usually social work. We have a whole team together to put together a game plan for that patient. Um, I think we have enough experience now. Like I said, I would, I would feel very confident guessing that as you enter that early third trimester period, that's when you're going to start to see that heart starting to get more strain. You're going to start to see, uh, if, you, if you watch it, you're going to start to see development of fetal high drops. And so um, trying to find that exact balance, you know, when do we deliver? I, I don't know the right answer to that. I think the answer is, is once you're coming up on that 27 to 28 week mark, if you really have a troublemaker tumor, that's when things are going to start to go. And that's where we say that balance of trying to keep things going in utero starts to be a problem. So once we start planning for exit, it comes together, that patient family, if they want to be there, our team to kind of lay out, you know, how are we going to do this or what are we going to do? We just took care of a, a patient recently with a, also a sacred costal teratoma that was also large, but it was essentially all cystic. And so she ended up delivering a full term. We actually, to get her a vaginal delivery, we did a needle drainage of the, of the cyst uh, before delivery. Um, and she had a vaginal delivery. And so for us, again, it's not any fetus that has a large mass coming off the sacrum needs an exit procedure like this. It is, it is what secondary effects, what do my cardiologist tell me are happening uh, uh, to make that decision? Yeah. Okay, well, can you talk a little bit about the, you know, this is obviously a new field about the supply and demand meaning of, of like all the kids that have something that can be detected in utero, how many of them are going to potentially, you know, 20 years from now benefit from a procedure? How many of them, like what percentage is getting it right now? And it's, is it more finding the patients or is it more having the, the teams that are prepared to intervene? I'll make a quick comment yeah. and then I hand it. Um, you know, I think where you're um, talking is screening, right? We These patients have to be screened appropriately, detected out, where maybe uh, in the environment and rural communities, they may not have access to these to this type of evaluation. 
that's one of our struggles, even with cardiac disease, to make sure that we're getting these uh, patients to the tertiary quaternary care centers for options to even be laid out for the families and the plans that have been in place um, to offer to many families and, and patients. Um, we want to expand that reach. Um, as far as outcomes, as you saw, you know, there's even ongoing developments in this day and age with this recent publication of the intervention prenatally for vein of Galen, like we're pushing the, the technology. And as our medical knowledge under um, is pushed, our, our partners in the biomedical engineering industry to have the tools to actually do the intervention um, has to continue to grow. And it's really cool to see that partnership between industry and clinical medicine to offer this. And I think time will tell as we um, uh, use these new innovative techniques of what the outcomes and how we change them. I think there are um, several studies and lots of experience, for example, and I'll turn this over to you, Nick, um, uh, in terms of what the outcomes and how we can make a difference for like SCT uh, intervening prenatally. And I'll let yeah. you make it. Comment. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the, I, I mean, I would say the, uh, the most, ex I guess, most exciting thing uh, that we do are things like these videos and in these fetal procedures. The truth is, is if you look at at least for our referral uh, base, if you look at the amount of referrals we get, a patient that actually gets a fetal procedure is like a super small part of that, less than 5% at least actually needs it, where maybe it, it does not as exciting uh, for videos and things in a talk, but the place I think we really do make the intervention, the real intervention we're doing, as Dr. Limblade said, is by getting better at screening and using imaging techniques, we can set these babies up for success. So I think if you looked at it, if you really looked at, again, what we do in it at Children's Hospital Colorado is the, the really the goal of our program is to get a great evaluation in utero and then get those babies into the hands of the pediatric specialists like right away. And part of that triage that's super important as well is like not everybody has to deliver at our hospital, right? Not every baby that has a cardiac anomaly has to deliver in Children's Hospital. They can deliver uh, down in one of our hospitals down south in the community and then follow up. And so trying to find that balance uh, of that. So you have to have good screening. You have to have good expertise. And like I said, if you really looked at it, it's a hard thing to study, but if you looked at where are we making the biggest difference, the biggest difference is, is getting these babies into the hands of the experts as quickly as possible. I'm sure when you take tests, I'm old enough now, I don't take many tests anymore, I guess, but like, you know, I'm sure you still take tests and you still talk about a baby comes out and has these five findings, what's your differential diagnosis? We're never going to be able to get away from that exact scenario, but I do think realistically speaking, it's not as common anymore to have a baby show up with whatever physical symptoms, and now you've got to really figure out what's going on. Hopefully, you know, this is my lesion, this is the problem, and you can have a better plan in place. So just like everything, I, I, I sit around and preach all the time, like, if we can get go from reactive to proactive in everything we do. I think we're making a big difference in medicine, right? Be proactive, be prepared, be ready for things rather than completely reactive. I think mm -hmm. that's a good that's a good change. We're out of time. I'm gonna see that one mark we got in. Cool. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.